introduce Kelly, who you've been meeting over the last two days. Um, Kelly got in touch with me a few months ago because of uh, somehow I think you found the Lazo Institute on the internet, and you got in touch and you very kindly sent me your book. Um, an amazing book, The Art of Inner Alchemy, and I must say it, it, was, it was a joy to read. Um, Kelly's background, I'm sure she'll tell you a little bit about herself as an education, but now she's uh, all about spiritual healing. And the approach she uses, which is all explained in her book, I, I thought was really, really easy to understand, but absolutely fascinating. And I'm looking forward to her sharing her journey and, and what it's all about. Exactly. So welcome, lovely to see you. And uh, over to you. Tell you, you know the, the Willy Wonka saying, so much time and so little to do. Oh, wait a minute, strike that, reverse it. This is how I felt this morning. And I had to put this slide up because I'm thinking, I have so much to share. How do I possibly pick and choose? And, and you know, what is it that is essential that we, that we look at? So I really started to think about everything that we've been talking about in the last couple of days. Everyone very consistently has said, I really want to bridge the gap between mysticism and science. This has been my goal. I can't even tell you, I'm going to explain a little bit about myself, but I jokingly call myself the pragmatic psychic, the, the conservative clairvoyant, because I really don't want to just hear about spirituality. I want to hear about the realities. Like, I want to know what it is. So we had some big questions that we all talked about. Dr. Laszlo started us out and presented this with us. What is consciousness? We want to know. We want to know what is the role of the brain in consciousness. We want to know how are we intuitive? How are we clairvoyant? What is coming in? Is there collective consciousness? How do we know that? How do we access it? Why isn't mainstream science talking about this? And this is something I want to present a lot about today, is why? And what steps do we actually take to catalyze this shift? To do that, I've got to tell you a little bit about who you're, you're staring at right now. And what brings me to this place where I have any authority to speak on this at all? I am not a quantum physicist. I'm not a theologian. I am a former educator. I am a former principal, a former college professor. I was working at the state of Wisconsin as an educational trainer and developer, and I keynoted everywhere, and I was really full of my own self-importance. And back that up. I have been speaking to a set of guys since I was six years old. And I had my very first out-of-body experience at six. I consciously realized I was talking to them at eight, but I didn't realize it. By the time I was 19 years old, I was having premonitions and visions. I was seeing things that were going to happen in the future, like, like videos in my mind. And I was very confused and very upset about it, to tell you the truth. I actually then decided, by the time I'm 19, you realize how weird you are. You realize that you're not like anyone else, and what, are, what is wrong with you? You need to fit in, you need to be normal. And I was like, well that's fine, you know what? I am going to not be psychic. Yeah, I'll show you guys you're not going to be psychic. <laughs> that didn't work so well. <laughs> and eventually, I went through getting all my degrees, and I got my PhD minus the dissertation, because you don't need it in education. So. I went through and tried to find all that importance. I tried to live normal, and nothing would let me live normal. So during this time, as a state educational trainer, I also became a Reiki master. I started to open up to my gift, and started to realize what a waste it was that I was in education where I couldn't make a difference, no matter what I did. But I could make a difference with this amazing gift that I finally decided to embrace. So in meditation one day, my guide said to me, and I called them my guides very lovingly, because they really are a multitude, and what I guess I am more listening to than anything is my higher self and a collective consciousness. It's a call them guys because I don't know what else to refer to it as. So I'm in meditation one day, and they said, you know what? You're leaving education. And I'm like, I am not. And they said, yes, you are. I said, I am not. And they said, Kelly, how do you feel when you do Reiki? And I'm like, ah. And they said, OK, how do you feel when you are in education? And they're like, <clears throat> okay, now go. I left that meditation Monday morning. I went to my state job and I quit. And to the horror of my family, as a matter of fact, my father said, you are socially irresponsible. 
Nobody leaves their pension. Well, I did. <laughs> that is the best thing I ever did. So let me fast forward. Since that time, I started a holistic healing or a, 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 a center in California. I left it. I gave away my personal possessions. I moved to the top of a mountain, and I sat in my own silence for a while. I then left everything again, gave away anything I had at the top of the mountain, and I went on the road, and I started to write books, and I started to really search inside. And my guides have brought through such wisdom, it is unbelievable. The things that they have shown me about life and the purpose of life and giving me meaning behind things has been incredible. So since then, I've worked with thousands of clients around the world to help them to understand how you heal through this human condition. How do you understand the purpose? How do you find your authentic self? How do you let go of importance and stop caring what anybody thinks of you? How do you be true? That's why I'm here. So, I loved it when Bobby said yesterday, she said, I really want to know what life is all about. I loved it when she said that, because me too. And I find that everybody does. We're all searching for this answer, so I want to ask you, what is this life about? And you may not answer 42, like it was painstakingly shown in, in Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. If you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. So tell me, what, what, what is this? Just pop corn up. Experience. To be happy. What is that? To be happy. To be happy? Okay, what else? Love, love and wisdom. Knowledge and wisdom. What love? Love and wisdom. Love. Love. love and wisdom. Beautiful. And experience. Else? Experience. I love that. I agree. But I'm going to share a different idea. I ask almost every single client, what is the purpose of this life? What do you think you're doing here? What do you think we're in these bodies for? And they consistently tell me the same thing. It's to learn to love. It's to learn that, you know, to find your purpose. It's to be in service. And this is what my guides have said to me very consistently. And when I work with a client, I work with their guides as well, and their higher self. And so all of this perspective, this is what they say. Oh, honey, hell. Kelly, come up. You did not come here to be in peace. If you were going to be in peace, you would have stayed where the hell you were. You came down here to get into the muck of it. You came here to learn about human conditioning. You came here to get so conditioned that you wouldn't even like yourself much. You came here to get into emotions. You came here to get into projection. You came here to struggle so that you can fight through to find one big thing. Love is not an action. You can't give it and you can't receive it. It's a state of being. So we're not here to learn to love. We're learning to reclaim our innocence and understand we are love. Then, it doesn't matter if we're important. It doesn't matter if anybody loves us. It doesn't matter if you're rejected, because nobody can really reject you, and nobody can really hurt you. Hmm. So I said, okay, beautiful guys, <laughs> beautiful source, what, how do you want me to explain this all? And they started to teach me mathematics. They started to teach me science. Right through my mind's eye, I was explaining to Anne the other day, Three days, my guys presented me with a room of geometry in front of me. And they would show me symbols, and they would show me movements. The first thing they ever showed me was a spiral. And they highlighted it in this bright yellow. And all of a sudden, this information was there. And they said, do you understand? And realizing that I had no idea whether I could articulate that or not, I knew I understood. And they showed rooms eventually. One of the things they shared, which is essential, they said, you have to understand that everything in life is a little point of light. Everything breaks down into this. I didn't know it at the time, but they're called biophotons and photons, which we've been talking about. I learned that later on. But they said, these little points of light, imagine this, everything is. The air, your body, this table, everything is a little point of light. And it's important that you understand that because there's something about these little points of light. They all move. They said to me, did you know that movement creates mathematics? Did you know that movement creates a language? So if we've got a, a sound language or a sound language. We've got a sight language. We've got a color language. But we also have an intuitive language. We can hear source energy. We can hear each other. And we can understand when we learn how to listen to the language. And we open up to the language. And they said, this also tells you something else, Ms. Kellish Way. They said, 
you are not separate. Because if you are little points of light, and the air is little points of light, and the trees are, and the universe is, how can you ever be separate? And I said, okay, I got this. They said, yeah, we want you to understand something else. If that's the case, if everything is just a bunch of little free floating points of light, and they said to me, I said, well, then why am I solid? I'm solid. And they said, okay, that's very funny. And they said, you're not. They said, you have a little program in you that you chose to have through your DNA that tells you how to, every millisecond, you refresh a screen. And every millisecond, or a fraction of a millisecond, you're refreshing this screen, and you are resetting to this body. And they said, so you're not solid. You're just a computer program that's biological, that's resetting. And I'm like, well, that's cool. <laughs> and they said, OK, get it now? And I said, yeah. And they said, I want you to know, if that's the case, then the same mathematics that runs a computer is the same way you run. You're no different than a computer. You're no different than a light bulb. You're no different than anything. The same mathematics governs everything. The same mathematical principles. You can't separate them out. So this has a very important um, connotation. You guys ever seen this picture? Oh, it's so awesome. This is a good one. So when I was six years old, I had that out-of-body experience. What my guides were sharing with me is they were, they were um, my parents had had a party. And they didn't normally, so I wasn't used to the energy of a party in the house. And, you know, at six, I was really not understanding what energy was, but I was a little freaked out. So I went down, and everyone else was asleep upstairs, and I'm like, whoa. All of a sudden, I was so overwhelmed, I laid on the ground. And all of a sudden, I'm out of my body, and I'm in the universe. And then I'm in my body. And then I'm inside this universe inside me. And then I'm inside my body, and then I'm out, and then I'm in, and then I'm and it kept happening, and I'm like, six years old, laying on the ground, freaking out because I'm in and out of my body, but I'm seeing these things. Guess what my guys were trying to teach me at six? <laughs> Macrocosm versus microcosm. What is out there in the universe, you break down to inside of you. Did you ever hear that understanding that life is about a, a, a torus that folds in and out of itself? Yeah, I'll get to that. This right here is a brain cell. This is the universe. It looks the same because the same mathematical principles create everything. This is the birth of a cell, a little myosis with mitosis going on there. This is the death of a star. This is the iris of your eye. Here's a nebula in space. Look the same? Of course they do, because the same mathematics governs everything. I said, okay. Help me to explain this further. And this is what they told me. They said, use the Fibonacci spiral. And I'm like, ooh, that's kind of fun. So we know that the Fibonacci spiral is a series of 90 degree angles and ratios, right? So 2 and 3 is 5, 3 and 5 is 8, 5 and 8 is 13, just keeps going on. And I said, okay. They said, show where it is in nature. Everywhere, right? A pine cone, the way a leaf grows, a hurricane, a tornado, a sunflower, a conch shell, a rose. They said, now look at your face. Ooh, look at that. Just the ear. Just the little part in your finger. That's the Fibonacci spiral. There it is on your face going that way, your face going this way. Oh, if you get into the Caribbean water and you flip your hair all sexy, guess what? You got the Fibonacci spiral. <laughs> Not so sexy. Yeah, you're just creating somehow. <laughs> Here it is in space. Okay, there's no separation. So I said, okay, now what? And they said, then we want you to understand this. Everything grows in ages. Everything. It can't not. And I said, oh, okay. So that means the chair that you're sitting in ages. That means that your body does. That means that the solar systems do. That means, okay, that even our lineage, or our humanity, or this planet, ages. This becomes really important to understand what's going on right now with this shift. There's also something else that ages, and that's your soul. We know our body ages through time. We go from baby to infant to young to mature to old. Yep, we do. But so does our soul. Your body goes through this thing called meiosis and mitosis, but so did your soul. It is going to be so cool when I show you. You're going to be mind blown. 
So, <laughs> your soul goes from a baby to an infant, to a young, to mature, to a whole. And my God shared with me that you go through 12 levels of soul development. Guess what grade you are in here? Two. Two. Three. Here's grade one. It's called service to creation. So you become one little point of light. And you're like, oh, I exist. Okay. Now what? All right. That's pretty much it. And you sit there and you learn to be created and exist. And, and you're just this beautiful love. And I said to my guys, well, if you're just beautiful love when you're created, why would you make us come to earth and go to this? And they said, because, Kelly, you're so silly, human. They said, when you are first existing, you're love, but you're not wise love. You're not expanded love. And you're certainly not unconditional love. You're like this little fairy love. <gasps> it's love. And they said, we need you to be expanded. We need you to be balanced. So you swing over, and you get conditioned by Earth. And when you get conditioned by Earth, now you can expand. Now you can understand. And now you're balanced. Now you are expansive, and you are deep, and you are wise, and you are experienced, and you are balanced. And you're unconditional love because you got conditioned. And you fought through it and still liked yourself. Congratulations. So service to creation looks like this. Oh, yes, and I did want to put Dr. Jude, um, what she said is that the universe is a great thought, not a great thing. And she's so right. Check this out. When you're first created as a soul, you are just a speck of energy. This little one little point of light, right? And you're like, oh, this is so cool. I'm bored. No what? And <laughs> so your soul is like, well, let's expand. Let's do meiosis and mitosis. And let's expand. And all of a sudden you're like this. Whoa! Okay, so this is what it looks like two-dimensionally. You're like, look over here. That's really cool. Whoa, look at this perspective. Whoa, look at it from over here. And then bored. So I think I better expand again. And you continue to expand. And you expand. And you expand. Until you get to this beautiful, beautiful thing. One of the basic forms of sacred geometry. This is what it looks like three-dimensionally. And it's called the ebb of life. Incidentally, here's a five-cell embryo. Oh, you mean the same mathematics creates your soul as does your body? Sure, it's the same movement. Eventually, you expand and you expand and you expand and you expand until you get to this amazing picture. This is called the, the fruit of life. Most of you might know it when it looks like this. That's called the flower of life. Have you noticed how much that's being seen these days? It's on shirts, and it's on medallions, it's on earrings, it's on all over the place. Did you know what was the story of your creation? Did you know what was your soul? Did you know? I said to my guys, I said, well, okay, if this is a story of our creation, and that's what this whole flower of life means, why are they only showing it like this circle? They said, Kelly, it's because you don't have full expanded consciousness. It's a story to indicate you are in a container. You're in a body. You don't, you don't remember where you came from. We didn't give you that. We gave you this. <laughs> you're, you're shrouded. And I was like, ah, oh, well, that's, that's brilliant, they said, isn't it? They even told me, they said, crop circles are a story of your creation. Eventually, you'll all figure it out. And I was like, cool. So, did you know that every ancient civilization actually has the flower of life in their history? And they call it the same name. They call it the flower of life in their own language. And I said to my guys, I said, well, how is that? And they say, so how does everybody have the same name? They're like, don't you think every civilization has had seers like you? Oh, yeah, that's cool. So here it is in Egypt. It's on the walls of the tombs, the pyramids. Here it is in a, in a church in Turkey. Here it is, and this is an Asian artifact, but it was found in Switzerland. Here it is in Bulgaria, in China, and all over the place. Right? You're going to find it even in Buddha's hand. It's just saying, this is your creation, this is you. Wow. 
And then I said, okay, that's awesome. And they said, but now there's something else we need to show you about this consciousness of yours. And I was like, all right. And they said, you take this, the corners of the hexagon, and, and actually you want to imagine this three-dimensionally, it's like, I think it's a dodecahedron. Um, if you're looking at the, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I was wondering which one that is. So if you take the corners, and you take the intersecting spheres, and you connect all their centers, anyone want to guess what's created? <coughs> Metatron's cube. Metatron's cube, if you imagine this three-dimensionally, is very, very significant that it's part of your soul. Because of this, it contains all of the platonic solids. The platonic solids are the building blocks of everything in creation. So guess what that means? You are a powerful creator. Powerful. You have in your very soul the ability to create anything you want. You have the ability, the ability to be healthy or not healthy, to be happy or sad. You have the ability to create a body, and you did. There's a particular shape I want to point out, and that's the star tetrahedron. So a star tetrahedron, if you don't know, are two interlocking tetrahedrons. So a pyramid has a square base, tetrahedron has a triangle base. They're interlocked together. That's going to become significant in a moment. And if we look at where it would be on your soul, on the fruit of life, that's where it would be represented. That's where the movement is actually going on in your body, in your soul. Now, we're going to back up the train a minute. Everything in your body is a cell, right? Hair cell, blood cell, tissue cell, doesn't matter what it is, it's a cell. Okay, nothing in your body doesn't break down into a cell. All right? Inside of the cell, we know that we've got, you know, the vacuole and the mitochondrial DNA and the, the DNA and, you know, the amine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine that interlock together to create you. Woo! That's cool stuff. And if we go into any part of that cell, I don't care what part it is, it all breaks down to the same thing. It all breaks down into molecules. All molecules break down into the same thing. Different configurations of atoms. He was just making that point. <laughs> so, different configurations of atoms, that's it? You I mean we're just atoms? Well, no, it's better than that. Science has been able to look inside the proton and the neutron. They can't look at an electron because the little buggers are, are elusive. They can't capture them. They can see their path, but they don't know where they land. But they can capture a proton and a neutron. Now, these next slides I'm about to show you, I cannot find the source. I have tried to find these people, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Um, I, I don't know how to So anyway, <laughs> but this is what they found. Inside of the proton and the neutron, it looks like a universe. This is what my guys were trying to show me when I was six years old. I saw the universe in me, and I was like, whoa! Here it is. Your little points of light. Now watch it. We get into these little points of light that radiate light and radiate heat. If you get into one of these biophotons, remember photon means point of light, and biophoton means it's in a biological being. So if we get in and we look at the radiation of heat and light, it's beautiful, right? But let's go a little bit closer. 30,000 times magnified. You start to see a shape forming. Now, you look up and again, and check out that shape in there. Remember the, the, um, the star tetrahedron? And take a look on the outside. Is that a hexagon? I think it is. If you zoom in a little closer, there's that egg of life I was showing you at the beginning. And check this out. This is the closest that they can get in on a biophoton. And what is that? That would be your conscious thought. So there are a lot of ramifications for this. This means that inside of you, you break down into nothing but your own thought. Nothing. This means that your body is just a representation of your beliefs and your emotions and your thoughts. This means that every illness in your body, you create. This means that, okay, so one of the things I didn't tell you is I've had 11 operations, I've broken 10 bones, I have had nine different health conditions that were really quite serious. My bones were dying. It's something called Kynebox disease. I've had a broken vertebrae, reconstructed hips. I've had, you know, oh, what, reconstructed hips? 
constructed. It was, I was a, quite a mess. But I was also not loving myself. I was very insecure. I had, um, I would, if I went into a social situation, I would hide in the bathroom, almost hyperventilating. I was full of drama. I was a victim. I was projecting. I needed attention. Oh, I was full of the human condition. Do you know how I healed every single one of these? I knew that I broke down into those little points of life. And I knew that I was powerful. So the last surgery I had was my, my right hip reconstructed. And it was bad. I was born with hip defects. And so I had a flat part on my hip. And so it would hit my cartilage. And over time, my cartilage ossified or turned to bone. And it started to tear all of the cartilage. And then I developed bursitis. So eventually the tear would get so bad I couldn't walk. So they reconstructed the hip. And after that, I learned about this. 45, this hip came up. And I was like, oh gosh. And the MRI showed it was terrible. And they're like, you're going to have to have that reconstructed. I'm like, no, I'm dealing with this. And they're like, good luck with that. And I sat for a week and I said this, you can do this. You know what you break down into. You're not solid. Rearrange your bio photons. Rearrange your thought. And, and then I go like this, you're insane. But science says, no, 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 you can do this. But the doctors say, no, no, you can do this. And eventually, I decided I could take a gander how many days it took me to heal my hip. Seven? <laughs> Three days. That's it. It's been five years. I turned 50 this year. And this hip is stronger than this one. It is amazing. We don't have it. We're fine. We've got a lot of power. So, here's the deal. Here's some of the ramifications of that. Each memory inside each of your bio biophotons, which there are a lot you can imagine. That means that it holds your thought, it holds, your, holds a charge, it holds your emotion. So it's going to hold a negative charge in your body, or a neutral charge, or a positive charge. So it'll hold a bunch of electrons around a memory, or a bunch of neutrons about around a memory, or a bunch of protons around a memory. And did you know what? You can heal this physical stuff in your body when you learn to heal those charges. That's what this, these books are about. This, this is a workbook. This is my team book. And it's about, about 18 activities and 17 self-reflections that help you to understand how to let go. I've got an adult book about to come out. Because when we can learn to let go of those charges, we can heal our body. When I learned to love myself, oh, I didn't have asthma anymore? Oh, you mean I didn't have an autoimmune disease? Oh, you mean I didn't have fibromyalgia? Oh, and your arms are an extension of your heart chakra, which means that I didn't have my Pinebox disease anymore? Everything went away. With all those operations and all those broken bones, you'd think I would be in a lot of pain, especially at 50. I got no pain. Except for when I my ankle. Not a but, but that healed. I actually did not do surgery. I had about um, two torn tendons and all my ligaments and uh, everything was broken and strained. And I did not do surgery. I healed on my own and I'm fine. And thank you, where is my lovely healer? <laughs> so, what does this all mean? Okay, so your biophotons that you break down to in your body are conditioned to the human experience. Please understand this. Photons are not. Okay? Everything out here, they're not. So when someone is a holistic healer, I train about the realities of how you actually bring this into your body. I teach the biomechanics behind it, and I help them to understand what you're actually doing. You're using your magnetics and electrics in your own body to bring unconditioned points of light into the body to heal it. That's cool. Okay? But we can also bring our body into non-condition. So, well, now the question comes to why are we conditioned? Okay, Susan said, we are made of light. Okay, right? We're made of light. And she's absolutely right, we are. And Mark said, matter is derived from conscious thought. You couldn't have been more right. It is your conscious thought. Your conscious thought, your soul, is your light. So remember this whole thing about you got created and you need to come here and you get conditioned? You do. So let's go back to the story of your creation. You're a little 
middle points of light. You're not conditioned yet. And you're like, I am fully expanded. I am a, I'm a hexagon, and I've got all the photonic solids in me. I am powerful. And then you're like, I am ready for a body. <laughs> and Source is like, <clears throat> okay, well, let's take it slow. Okay, let's not jump into that human body yet. Let's go to grade two. Okay, grade two is service to instinct. Let's let you get used to it. So let's just start you out as an amoeba. Can you move? How does that feel? Okay? And then they're like, okay, let's try a fly or a gnat. Can you fly? Oh, you're doing great. Okay, great. How about something like a fox? Ooh, that's great. Let's get you into a whale body. Can you swim? Okay? And, and then maybe you'll be in a orangutan. Who knows? Why do you think people talk about spirit animals? You've been animals. How do you think you're going to, you're not going to just jump into this. Okay? You're skipping a step. So grade two is you learn to be an animal. You go from a baby animal to an infant animal to a young animal to mature to an old animal. And at the latter end of the animal lives, you're very intuitive. You're very expanded and you've got somewhat of an ego. You create community. And then you're like, okay, I got it. I can eat and I can reproduce and I fight or flight. I got it. You're like, yes, you do. Go to grade three. Okay, grade three. Let's put you into a human body. All right? Now, the human body has a very interesting thing with it. It has an ego. This is what an ego does. It is tough. This is where the conditioning comes from. It keeps you looking for love outside of you. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you want me? Am I okay? And it keeps you looking for acceptance. Do you like me? Are you going to reject me? Are you going to betray me? Are you going to hurt me? It keeps you looking for importance. Now, let me wear my appropriate clothing and show you just how very important I am. <laughs> Do you know what happens when you start to get through the soul ages? You, lo you lose the importance and you reclaim your innocence. You don't care if somebody thinks you're important. You're like, you know what? I'm playful, and I am fun, and I am innocent, and I don't need to be anything for you. I'm going to be real. So here's what happens with that ego. You fear you're not going to be enough and you will not have enough. There's a really, really important thing that happens when you come to Earth School. Welcome to Earth School, everyone. Welcome. Your textbooks are the people who come in and they challenge you. And they hurt you. Your textbooks are those experiences that you go through where you can say you're going through suffering. Now, I was giving a talk on this in California, and some man is at the back of the audience, and he said, and I'm like, yes. And he said, so you are trying to tell me that a loving God is going to have children suffer in this lifetime. And I said, yes. Yes, I am. Thank you. You can sit. So this is purposeful, guys. You know what you're getting into when you come here. This isn't a shock to you and your soul. It's a shock when you get here, because you get here and you go through and you're like, this is not what I had in mind. But, you know, we chose it. This is what we wanted. Okay? So we come here and we go through all these textbooks and they're hard. And eventually, you realize how purposeful they are. We were talking at dinner last night about a very difficult experience I've been through recently. I was assaulted in Belmopan, Belize, um, physically, and left in the middle of nowhere at that Mayan cave. And it was very difficult. This was three months ago. And I did a YouTube series to help people to understand that I am not hard. You cannot harm my soul. You cannot harm my being. You cannot reject me. You can try. Good luck. I am. And I talked to people about that. And even when I, when I was going into it, people were like, how many of all people didn't you know? And I, in my video, too, I talk about how I knew. But I also heard, just walk through this. Yeah. You can't harm me. You can dismember me all you want. You can, you know, do whatever you want, but I'm still going to go on. You can't kill this soul. Right? Hard experiences, but they're worth it. So what are you doing here? You're here to learn to be preoccupied with yourself. You're in grade three. It's all about you. Okay. We learn about materialism, wealth, and status, and power, and fear, and this drive for importance. Okay? And why? Because you're getting conditioned. You're going to get conditioned into shame, and guilt, and depression, and sadness, and into fear, and insecurities. 
self-doubt, oh, that was my good one. Powerlessness, anger, pride. Yeah. And here's what happens. People are born with the ego. The ego gets the end of fear. Fear that you're not going to have enough or be enough. And so what do we do as humans? We develop systems that perpetuate the fear. I need to have more than you. I need to be better than you. I need to be stronger than you. So I'm going to create a system that's going to let you do that. We did it. It's purposeful. Those systems allow people to be right and validated and respected and in control and better than and seen. And when people need to be those things, what do we do? We harm the planet, we harm the animals, we harm ourselves, and we harm each other. Again, it's purposeful. Bobby also said, hope you don't mind. <laughs> we believe in separateness. That's what's wrong. Yes, that's what's wrong. Can you ever unconditionally love yourself if you've never been conditioned? No. No. So the whole thing here is can you tame the ego beast? Can you do it? Can you stop with materialism and wealth and status and power? Can you love yourself no matter what you've been through? Can you let go of those charges inside of you? And you can. They actually come out of your body just like electrical charges leave your body when you're not afraid to face the hardest experiences that you've gone through here. If I can face being beat up, a man tromping on my head, and go, wow, I forgive you and I love you, and thank you for being my teacher. If I can do that, you can too. Remember, this whole thing is about learning that love is not an action. Love's state of being. It didn't matter what that man did to me because he kept in my life. Nobody can. Right? When I don't do it. And I spent years doing it. So now there's a very important thing to understand so that we can get to some of the other really important things that I've got to share with you. Ooh, how much time do I have? You can continue. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this yeah, is... Okay, yeah. okay, this is critical. <laughs> Critical stuff. So, I want you to understand this graphic. This is you coming from source, or just your soul, before you come to Earth school. Okay? Over here is when you're fully immersed in the ego. We enter in here, okay? So we enter our Earth lives, and we go through many, 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 many lives. You know what my guide said to me? He said, Kelly, you have to go through the yin and the yang of everything. You would have been rich, poor, male, female, gay, straight. You would have been the pedophile. You would have been the murderer. You would have been the victim to all of it. And I remember when they were telling me this. When this graphic came through, I was working with a client in person. Most of the time I do phone, but I was in person. And I, I, I grabbed this, you know, I was talking to, the, to them, and they asked me, or she asked me this question. And with authority, not knowing anything about this, I grab a clipboard and I start to tell her all about the soul ages. And I describe every single one and this whole graphic. And I sat there in the background of my mind, hearing myself talk, going, that is so cool. <laughs> so stealing that. <laughs> Thank you. It was amazing. And what they, they said is this. They said, okay, so you have to go through all this stuff. And I remember that right after I shared this, I was walking downtown in Ohio, California. And I was thinking in my mind, I'm like, well, I'm sure I've never murdered. Stupid question to ask. My guides immediately brought in a memory that I've had probably about um, maybe a dozen half lives they brought in really significantly for me to, to see and view. And they brought in this life where I was a male, I was full of myself, I was full of power, and they gave me the emotion, the adrenaline, the feeling, the, mo the, the reason, right before I murdered. Thank God they didn't show the act. But I remember feeling all that, and I just stopped, and I was like, why did you show me that? And they said, don't you think for one minute, Kelly Schweigel, if you're going to work with clients, don't you think for one minute you haven't done that too? They said, you need to know you did. And they said, so you need to have compassion. And you need to understand, there is no right or wrong in our mind in Earth. There's accountability, and there's growth. We don't judge that. We don't like it, but we don't judge it. I have worked since then with attempted murderers. I have worked with pedophiles. I have worked with victims of a lot. 
I work with a lot of perpetrators, and I love them all equally. That is the unconditional love we're seeking. So when we come to this earth, and we're just a baby soul, this is about 20% of our earth. Baby souls are like this. They want oneness because they miss source. They don't realize it, but they do. They're also not wise. They're new to the ego. So for them, love is need. I need you to love me. And because they're so tumultuous and they're not wise and they miss their oneness, they go into things like cults and gangs and warring religions. You run not America, close the border. Trump supporter. <laughs> did I say that? I did. So, <laughs> the other things that happen are that, that, that they're so unwise, so if you reject them, they kick you out of the tribe. They kick you out of the gang. They murder you. They hurt you. You are, you're disowned. You're tumultuous. And they have, they're not close to earth, so now they're poor. They don't know how to get the money. Oh. Tumultuous, but purposeful. Imagine it like a you know, one or two year old in our world. Okay, you wouldn't look at a one or two year old and go, you are bad. You would say, oh, let's teach you. Okay? Then you go through lives, 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 lives. You get to infants. Let me describe infants. 50% of our world. I got it now. Okay. I know how to be. This is how life is expected to be learned or to be lived. We do this, and we do that, we do this, and these are all explained in my book if you're interested. We, this is how we live our life. Now, don't be gay, and don't have a tattoo, because I can't handle that. That's just weird. And don't be psychic, because we don't do that. Okay, that's not what we do. We work hard for our day's wage. We follow all the rules. We don't bend them. We grow up, and we get married, and we have children, and we have a job, and we keep our pension, and we... <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah, to not move to the beat of your own drum, because I can't handle that. We are average religion, you know, middle of the road, Muslim, Jewish, Catholic, you know, Lutheran. We're just middle of the road. You know, we go to church on Sunday. I like to sit in the front, because not everybody sees me. We're, good. We're, good. We're getting a little wiser, okay? We're not an infant. We're not tumultuous. I'm not going to kick your butt anymore. But you know what? I'm going to gossip, and I'm going to be self-righteous, and I'm going to talk behind your back. Okay. Now, we're middle of the road income, because we're not quite to the money yet, but we're getting there. All right? Let me go through lives, 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 lives. Ooh! Now we're into narcissistic land. Okay? By the way, God loves narcissists because they help so many of us move on our journeys. <laughs> so, Earth School, when you're totally immersed in this, you are materialism, wealth, status, or power. I know how to make the money, and I know how to keep it from you. <laughs> I'm good at it. Yeah, I'm good at manipulation. I'm really, really, really important. And I need to dress the right way, and I need you to notice that I dress the right way. I want you to notice how fit my body is and how great I look. <laughs> <laughs> and I need that house to be okay and that car to be okay. I just need you to know this about me, okay? Good. All right. Oh, did you notice that I have more money or degrees than you? Because if you haven't, I'll point you out again. <laughs> I do not believe in spirituality. You guys are quacks. I do not believe in religion. If you make me go, I'm going to sit in the pew and I'm going to fall asleep, okay? I don't do that. I am atheist. Show me the facts. Show me the science. I need to know what it is. Yes, I do. Sounding like anyone you know. <laughs> then you just go through lives, 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 lives. And you get to the mature. And the mature souls are like, wait a minute. This is not about what I do. This is not about what you think of me. And this is not about who you think I am. This is about growing something here. I am drawn to spirituality. I don't know what it is. What's Reiki? I gotta find out. I gotta move to the beat of my own drum. I'm not like you. I don't wanna be like you. And you know what? Money? I don't like money. Let's we travel. Let's we have a nice house. But it doesn't drive me anymore. It doesn't define me. I define me. This is not about my identity. This is just about. Wow. I get it. 
And you learn and you learn and you learn. You grow. Also, so by the way, 20% of our world, 8% of our world, if you hadn't noticed. Old souls, oh, those are amazing ones. Just come and you see some of the kids who are being born today? You look into their eyes and you see the universe. You, you, these kids that are being born today are amazing. They're sitting on steps telling their mommy all about the, the meaning of life. And I'm like, <laughs> I was afraid. I laid on the ground and ripped six and shard. <laughs> I, I didn't do it. You know, I was scared. And guys, here, where's our scientific community? Why? Why can't they do this? Why don't these guys, all these guys, why don't they want to know about what we have to say? Why are the scientists over here doing this? Because they're atheists, because they're young. These guys do not have the vibrational frequency to hear what you're saying. It's a frequency, remember? My guys had said, language that comes out of your mouth is a frequency. If, you got, if you're complaining, this happened and that happened, blah, 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 guess what? You're creating mathematics. Don't think that's not going to come back and hurt you. It will. Okay, but the same thing, when we speak our wisdom, it has a vibration. And if their ears, their soul, is not attuned to that vibration, yet they can't hear it. So what does that mean for us? Because look at this. Okay. okay. Here we go. 90% of our world are baby, infant, and young souls. So now what? We can only speak to 10% of the world? Oh, now it's going to get interesting. Do you guys remember 2012, December 21st, when the world was going to end, and the Mayan calendar ended, and everybody was in upheaval? My guys were laughing, and they're like, the world's not ending. I'm like, well, then what's happening? And they said, will you please tell them that it's a shift? It's a really cool shit. <laughs> and I said, oh, is it going to be like suddenly? And they said, no, nothing happens suddenly. You mean the banks are going to collapse and we're not all going to get $500 million? No. Okay. Then what? They said, over the next 50 years, your society will be changing. They said, oh, and incidentally, Harold said, scientists can be materialistic. I wanted to point that out. When he was saying that, I was like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, let me get back to you. Where's my slides? Oh, dear, I have lost my slides. Uh, certainly did, but let me just share it anyway. So, what's going to happen is this. Every day, 300,000 people die. And on average, 300,000 people are born. Guess who are being born? Latter end of young, mature, and old souls. So within about 50 years, this whole chart is going to flip. Then we will have 50% mature souls, 20% old souls. They said, you're going to have a lot of latter end of young. They said about 15% will be latter end of young. So we still need people to catalyze, catalyze your interchange. Okay? We still need people to teach your lessons. And 5% will be new young. 8% will be infant and 2% will be baby. Wow. You know what we're doing? We are making such a difference. We are the way showers. This is what we're doing. We don't have to go, everybody wake up! They don't need to wake up. Do you know who the Essenes were? Yes. The Essenes are amazing, aren't they? They were a sect of people who lived in the, in the second century. Right? They were reputed to have trained Jesus and Mary Magdalene. They, um, they believed that all things were math and science. They believed that all religions were perfect based on the age of their soul. And I, I found out about them years later, and I'm like, I know that stuff. And my guy said, duh. <laughs> we bring through the same stuff to y'all. You just have to listen. Okay? And here was their motto that I implore you to please adopt. We comfort the sleeping souls. We don't try to awake them. They're not ready. Imagine if you went up to a, a, a five-year-old in our world right now and you're like, I need you right now to wake up and get married and drive a car. <laughs> They're not ready. You wouldn't do that to a baby. Why would you do it to a baby soul? It's not right. They need their growth and they need their experience like everyone else. 
We need to awaken those who are ready to be awakened. Do you know, I told you I've worked with thousands of people around the world. I have this little rule with the universe to not bring me anyone who's not ready to do the work because I don't care to convince them. Now, do I have compassion? I love baby souls. I don't judge. There's no hierarchy. They're beautiful. But, but I also am not going to try to awaken them. So when I was living on an island in Belize, I can tell you, I came across a lot of them. But I loved them. We had so much fun. We dove together and we played together. But I couldn't talk spirituality with them. The minute I even tried, they'd shut down and I'd let go. Okay. It's okay. Those who are awake, we keep them on their path. We need to keep each other on our path. That's what we're doing. Okay? What does Dr. Laszlo been doing this whole time keeping you on your path, awakening those who are ready to be awakened? So our roles as energetic healers, scientists, biologists, medical practitioners, quantum physicists, theologians, mediums, or clairvoyants, our job is to pave the way for a new way of thinking leading and behaving, but it's not a race. You have time. Okay? We need to help bring in those who are ready for this. And what's going to happen is we're going to get into, in the next 50 years, we'll be moving. The planet is also aging. That's the shift that was going on. Humanity is on the planet, so we're aging too. We're transitioning too. This is now going to be grade 4 Earth School instead of grade 3. Grade four is this, the fourth level of soul development. You get to live with a tame ego. You are driven by unconditional love, not fear. Did you know that in my book I talk about the seven levels of, of alchemy? And we actually alchemize ourselves going through all of our lives. The seventh stage, did you know you stop emoting? You don't really emote anymore. Emotions are low-level reactions to the human experience. When you feel all those charges, you don't really emote. You feel. You feel compassion or joy, but their emotions all rain in. And you're pretty, pretty balanced. And I had this woman come up to me at Belize and she viscerally yelled at me, I hate you! And I looked at her and I'm like, would you like to go talk? <laughs> and at the end of our talking, she's like, I love you, I'm just jealous of you. And I'm like, <laughs> 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 you don't really react anymore because there's no reason. When you heal yourself, right, you heal your heart. All things change. So we're going to do that. Competition no longer is necessary. That's for young souls. It's cooperation. You don't need to be important. You get to reclaim your innocence. We're going to treat our earth and our animals well. We're going to have free energy. Okay? We're going to have holistic natural healing. I brought people through cancer, healing cancer. I watched one woman who was throwing out her face in a line. And she used CBD oil, which was back then just, just um, hemp oil. And, and we would work with it holistically, and we watched it like fall off her face. Right? Mm -hmm. Healthy foods will become important. Incidentally, just so you know, I gave an entire hour long lecture on just eating. I've given a hundred lectures, my guys have actually, um, on everything you can imagine. So if you're interested, they're on my website. Oh, there's that one that I was looking for all this time. <laughs> Great representation. Isn't that pretty? Good. Okay, so, so how do we transition? There's some important things for you to understand. First thing you need to do is heal your younger youths who got conditioned by the human experience. Did you know that you created all your human conditioning that you needed before the age of 13? You sure did. I had 80 year old men working with me, crying, letting go of stuff, and all of a sudden living the remainder of their lives happy. You're never too old to heal. Release those negative charges. Forgive yourself and others for being human. Forgive them for being baby and for your young souls. They know not what they do. That's what that meant. Tame the ego and reclaim it. So how do you transition? There's some big things that have to happen, and this is some of the, stuff, the new stuff that I want to share very quickly about um, what's going on with what my guides have shared. And this is huge. The biggest things if you want to transition and you want to listen to collective consciousness. You want to listen to your guides, and you want to listen to your higher self. This is what must happen. You gotta get out of your head. You gotta listen. All right. You want to talk about listening to Akashic Records? You wanted to know about that. 
Well, you can listen. I've been listening for years. You've got Akashic Records in your body. The Earth has them. There's a collective consciousness of the Earth, okay, of our humanity. There's universal consciousness, God energy. Okay, you can listen to all those layers if you learn how. Duke Mark said, uh, when you're silent, the infinite can speak. Go with him for finding me, right? Yeah. And he was so right. It's the only way you can do it. So I want to share something essential. We've got two parts of the brain that we can think from, okay? We've got the frontal lobe right here. This is logical, sequential thinking. This is compartmentalization. It is rationalization. It is black and white thinking. It is problem solving. It is analyzing. But then we overanalyze and analyze some more. And then we start to take things personal. And then we make assumptions. And then we go down the rabbit hole of thought. And there's something else that's really crazy with this. Right at the base. So this is where your eye would be, okay? Nose would be here. Frontal lobe, right there. There's your forehead. Right at the base of this is the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland has some great chemicals that it releases. You know, it's the growth hormone when you're young, when you're pregnant, it helps you to have contractions and lactate. Woo but it also, when you're not pregnant or 12, it releases cortisol, the stress hormone, and adrenaline, the fear hormone. Guess what happens if you're stuck in your frontal lobe too much and you don't take time to get into another part of your brain? You get toxic with adrenaline and cortisol, which affects your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, which causes anxiety, depression, mental illness. It causes ADHD. It causes lack of being able to focus. It causes resentment and fear. It keeps you thinking you're not good enough. It is a product of the ego. The other thing it does is it does this. You're thinking, instead of receiving thought, Bringing it into your body, it projects it out into the outer world. So now it's your fault, and you did this, and if you were like that, I would be okay, and it's all my mother's fault. Okay? That's what it does. I'm scared of you. I don't like you. Woo! Life isn't safe. That's what that frontal lobe thinking does. Now, there's some good tools in there. We need to ration, right? We need to be rational. We need to analyze. We need to problem solve. But I want you to consider it a toolbox to access the tools. There's another place that you can think from. It's in your limbic system. This is your pineal gland. Did you know your pineal gland is a hollow gland? It's fluid filled and it has photoreceptors just like your eyeball. So your eyeball can see because energy enters in it from wavelengths and the photoreceptors pick up the wavelengths and project an image out. Now you described it much better. Okay, I love your description, but I'm not a biologist, I'm not a, I'm not a medical doctor. So that was my easy explanation. So, all right, then why do we have an eye in the center of our head? Well, you have five openings into that pineal gland. And incidentally, the pineal gland that has those photoreceptors releases melatonin so you can sleep. Metatonin. A chemical they believe causes you to get zen-like and peaceful and chill. It releases serotonin, the good mood elevator, so now you don't have to be depressed. It also releases a chemical called dimethyltryptamine, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So energy, also known as photons or biophotons, that are information carriers that carry your conscious thought or the Akashic Records can enter in in five places, the temples. You have a little jagged cross right here called the glabella fissure. It's an opening. The anterior fontanelle and the posterior fontanelle, soft spot when you're a baby, okay? Right back here by the occipital ridge. These five openings, guess where they meet? Right in the pineal. Isn't that fantastic? So all these little photoreceptors can start to pick up all of that information. Here's what my guides explained. No science to explain this, but I love the way they explained it. They said, guess what dimethyltryptamine does? And I said, do tell. And they said, when you are in this part of your brain enough, and you release enough dimethyltryptamine, it activates a portion of the cerebellum. And there's actually, it doesn't show it on here, but there's a little, little pathway, if you look at it biologically little pathway that goes right into the cerebellum from the pineal to the cerebellum. 
it activates this sensory perceptor. And that's how they activate your sixth sense. They said, this is like a translator for all the energy coming in. Okay? So now you can hear your guides. Now you can be clairvoyant. Now you can understand all of this. It's amazing. But you can't do it if you're in your chatterbox. Did you know that I probably chatter 10% of the time? I just exist. I train my brain not to do it. And you can do it. Again, if you want to know how, please contact me. I'd love to help. Okay? We've got to learn to get out of our brains. This is a satellite. It gives and receives information. This is a toolbox. Access it when you need. I think I'm out of time. So, am I out? Well, you are, but carry on. It's too fascinating to stop. <laughs> okay, I don't have much more. Do we more. agree? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. That's wonderful. So, okay, so now we have the ability. You guys all in your brains have a pineal gland. You all have a cerebellum. Just get out of your head. Now, what is the first thing you do to release um, the, the um, adrenaline and cortisol? There's a physiological switch. In the perineum, which, excuse for any uh, graphicness, but is in between the anus and vagina or anus and testes. There's a little switch there. It's a physiological switch. If you relax your pelvic floor and you breathe into the pelvic floor and you breathe high up into the lungs, it shuts down the release of cortisol and adrenaline. There's a reason for that. It's a biological reason, but I don't have time to tell you. Take deep breaths. Close your eyes. So do this with me for a moment. Close your eyes. Relax your pelvic floor. Let your Buddha belly go. Let your perineum go. Now take a deep breath in through the nose, deep into the base of the belly. Blow it up. Release through the mouth, slowly into the room. And now, just be still. Notice where your thought is. Is it in the forehead? I want you to imagine there's a room in the center of your head. And I want you to fall backward inside into that room. Imagine that since your eyes are closed, you don't need to see, so your sight can move inside of you. And instead of seeing, you're just aware. And you don't have to think. Be in the room, behind the eyes, in the center. Fall back even more. Now open the top of your head. Imagine it's like a big sunroof and it's opening. And you can connect in with God or Source or your higher self or your guides. Allow the energy to flow into that pineal. And now open your eyes. That's your pineal. Do that multiple times throughout the day. You catch yourself a chatter, go, oh, nice try, ego. I'm good enough. Okay? Access the toolbox when you need it, but get out. Harold said, um, meditation strengthens connection between the left and right brains, and he is right. The left and right brain, I like to call the forehead and the limbic system. Of course, not left and right, but that's where my guides explain. They said it's more this than it is this. Okay? They said those, those signals will cross, but it's more this. Again, no science for that one either, but I like it. Here's the other thing that happens. When you open up into your pineal, now you can bring energy down into here. If you're in this part of your brain, where's your energy going? It's going like this. Let me bring in that energy. And then you start projecting and being afraid and blaming. Okay? So we want to get it into our bodies. Did you know you have three brains? You have a cephalic brain in your head, a cardiac brain in your heart, that's why there's neurocardiology, the study of the heart brain, and you have an enteric brain. 100 million neurons in your head, 40,000 in your heart, 500 million in your gut. Why do you think gut instinct is so strong? Did you know there are seven types of clairvoyance? One of them is called uh, clairsentience, and that's gut knowing. There's also being empathic. That's the heart you talked about that, I believe. About being, you know, being uh, sensitive in the heart, what about it? Okay? You can be empathic, you can feel what other people feel. You have a gut knowing, you have all this, right? You can even have clear goose
taste, when death is around, I taste the metal. You can have clear salience, which is the smell. You can have pictures, right? Gifted sight. You can have gifted hearing, clear audience. There are all these beautiful ways that you can be clairvoyant, but you gotta open up. So when we open up here, now, we listen with our gut and our heart and our head. Your head part is just the receiver. Listen here and listen here more. Now there's a very important thing that I need to share with you that science again does not share. You know how um, every neuron holds a belief, right? And these beliefs, every belief has a little tentacle, that uh, neurites, that come out of them and they connect with each belief. So now you have your own unique belief system, all right? So all these neurites, right, are connecting head and heart and gut. How you think, how you feel, and whether you love yourself or not. And there's a really interesting thing that happens. Science does show that there are more signals being had sent from head to heart and gut to heart than upward. Why? Here's what science doesn't show, but my guides explain. They said, your heart beat, Kelly. I said, so? You're like, huh. Your heartbeat is creating movement. It's creating mathematics. Can I add to this? Please. People think that it's uh, only pump, but the heartbeat, every one second, give instructions by electromagnetic to every cell in the body. And every, and every cell, in the, you can measure it scientifically, because ECG, you can measure it from the finger. So every second, and the heartbeat change, and it changes every second. Every breath change is going up and down with your breath. When you spread it, it changes to it. Like a, like a, a contract of, uh, like, in, like in a symphony, it gives instruction to every second, to every cell in the body. Yes. And every cell, it was a receptor of quick and feeling. Thanks. And thank you. I did not know that, I'll be calling you. So, because <laughs> I need to have that information. All I know is what my mind said. So they said this, your heartbeat, it's, imagine it like a Morse code. It's creating mathematics, and the mathematics is carrying information about how you think and how you feel, and your DNA is programmed with what life lessons you chose to learn here, and so now, now all of a sudden it comes into here, and it's like, do you love yourself? No. Oh, and you haven't learned your life lesson? Well, let's put that out into the world. And what's going to come back to you? Anything for your highest and greatest good until you learn it, because until you screw up enough until you go through a, a enough failures, until you are going through the good, bad, beautiful, and ugly, and success, have enough successes around the life lesson, you are not ready to learn it. Which is why our life lesson, aka karma, cycle back around to us, cycle back around to us, cycle back around to us. Why did I have manipulative women come into my life time and time and time again? It was until I realized I was manipulative. It was just a reflection. And I was like, um, oh, there you are. And then I can heal it. Right? So, the heart code is, um, what is it going into? Now, I mentioned yesterday, I asked a question about the triangulation of the um, biophotons and the grid, or the hologram, or whatever you want to call that, the God particle, right? And entanglement theory. And I was concluded. But my guide said, you just keep a a chin up, Kelly, it's okay. And this is what they said. They said, share the story of your blue mist. So, I am working with a client one day, and again, sitting in front of me, and we were channeling his deceased mother because she had some information she needed to share with him. And it was for his healing, and it was important. And at the end, he said to me, oh, and he was Russian, and he said, will you ask her, and she said, I can't do a Russian accent, so I won't even try. He said, will you ask her? <laughs> Did she bring me my girlfriend, Lana? Because that would be just like her bring me my girlfriend, Lana. And she hysterically laughed. And she's like, oh, no, no, we don't do that. And I'm gone. I'm not in the room anymore. And I'm in the universe. And I'm like, oh, shoot, she kidnapped me. And I'm seeing in the distance this beautiful blue mist. And inside, as I got closer, I seen these little points of light. And as I got closer, I realized there were billions of them. And the coolest thing was happening with this little mist. It was doing this. Just like, you know how we, they had talked about how there are flocks of animals that are just in sync? All these lights were in sync. So as one moved, they all moved. It was the coolest thing in the world. And I was like, what is happening? And she said, 
see that one right there? I said, yeah. She said, that's you. I was like, what? She said, yeah. When you learn your lesson or don't learn your lesson, you affect everyone on the planet. When you choose to evolve or not to evolve, you affect everyone on the planet. And I remember the day that my guys were trying to teach me that we, we are so much more powerful than you think. And they said, do you not realize when you choose to be Miss Krabby Patty in the morning, okay, they said, you're affecting everyone. And I was like, oh, okay, I better heal. I better heal that human condition. And there's something else that's really important to understand before I share this next piece of information. Ah, here's another Bobby Stevens quote. <laughs> I love your stuff. Everyone and everything is connected. What affects one of us affects all of us. Oh, yes. And here's a little bit more of that. Susan said, tiny changes in the quantum world can have a large effect. Oh, yes. When I was in my 30s, I started seeing these little silver threads that connected solar plexus to solar plexus on people. And I was like, what is that? It looked like a big spider web. And, and I realized if I caught the line, I knew everything about that person. And if you started talking about somebody and I caught that line, even if they weren't there, I could, I could understand them. I could be on the phone and you talked about someone and I caught their line and all of a sudden I knew about them. I was like, what, what is this? And then I remember the day I saw it in the sky and I was like, but it was thicker and it was green. And then I remember the day I looked up at the stars and I saw that they were all connected in the same way. And they were connected to the planet. And all the trees were connected. And we were connected to the trees. And we were connected to the water. And we were connected to the animals. And it was just this big network, a.k.a. the grid. So when science started to come out with understandings, five minutes, you got it. And that's girls. Perfect. What they said is, when, when science started to come up with this, I was like, hallelujah, please show evidence of this because it's there. So what is the heart code going out into? The big grid. What is the big grid doing? Connecting us all. So how does synchronicity happen? How do we bring the perfect people together? Because our heartbeat is, is coding it. So are you a victim to anything in your life? Oh, hell no. You're creating it. Everything that is coming to your world is for your highest and greatest good. Was me getting beat up in Belmapan beliefs for my highest and greater, greatest good? You better believe it. Do I resent it? Absolutely not. Was it ple pleasant? No. So, here's the big world computer. A field that connects us all. Right? People call it the unity field. Nature's mind, why of God, quantum hologram or the grid. You are a big computer program inserted into this world. And you are programming the world every day as to how to show up for you so that you can get good conditions and you can learn that you're amazing and you can learn your own power. And we can transition this earth so that the little babies coming in have something great to come into. But you're not just on the computer, you're also the programmer. Yes, you are the programmer. Right, we are the, we are the computer program. So imagine a big Apple IIe and you're the little, you're the floppy disk. <laughs> that aged me. Okay, so here's my conclusion. <laughs> Love is not an action, it's a state of being. Please remember this. Unconditional love is for all. Okay? That means all. I don't care what somebody does. Can you accept them and love them? You don't have to invite them over for a barbecue, but can you love them? Okay? Move from emotions into feelings by healing yourself. Send and receive using your natural gift of clairvoyance. Reclaim your innocence. Be playful. And just in case you're wondering, here are the rest of the 12 loves of soul development that I've done. Level four, we're taming the ego. We will be a planet that, that souls will come to to live out lives as a tamed ego. Level five, all of a sudden you don't need a body and you're going to experience pure love because you cannot be in unconditional love with oneness if you've got the ego intact. So now you exist as love for a while. And after you really get just living as love, unconditional love this time, now you get to go through instruction. You're not in the body yet. Now you're going to learn all the math and all the science and all the purpose of all existence. Whoa! You get to go to massive school. Okay? We think. 
you know, somebody who's a, a quantum physicist is smart. You got nothing on these guys. <laughs> so then you're gonna be like, okay, you learned it, now apply it. So then you're gonna go to grade seven. And you're gonna become a movement. You're gonna become a tornado. You're going to orchestrate a hurricane. You are going to become a vortex. Once you understand how to move it, they're saying, okay, now can you do multiple at once? Can you become a planet? Now you're orchestrating currents and tide and all of this. What do you think of that? Woo, nice job. You did great. Now you're ready for a solar system. Can you do that? Can you do this? Can you hold it? Can you embody this? You got it? Great. How about a universe? Whole. Oh. And once you've got it, you understand the math, you understand creation, you understand everything is geometry and math, then what? Well, now can you take all that knowledge and we're going to plop you back into grade three and get you good in condition again. What are you going to do now? Can you have a foot in that world and a foot in our world? And can you go through this and not judge life? Can you go through life and understand it? Can you bring your knowledge? Can you teach? Right? How many of you wrote books because you had this passion and this understanding, somehow this understanding well beyond what we were ever taught here under? Well beyond. When you get that, here's what you understand. I value my pain and suffering as much as I value my good. They are equally beautiful. Thank you. And grade 12 is called embodying all that is also God. Yes, you are God's in the name. Thank you. Oh,